Today we're going to talk about the Ekafisk field, which is 51 years old and projected to uh, perhaps be around in another 30 years time. Ekafisk was the first North Sea giant oil field. I'm going to have a look at some interesting facts about the field and we're going to start with the discovery. It was 1962 that Philips Petroleum actually approached the Norwegian authorities um, seeking a license. Then in 1969, after 32 dry holes, uh, with only discoveries at Boulder and Cod, which at the time were thought to be non-commercial, um, it was in December of 1969 that oil was encountered in the remaining commitment well, uh, which was kind of drilled against a backdrop of having to forfeit $1 million or go ahead and drill the commitment. So um, the discovery was reported on the 23rd of December 1969. In terms of the geology, well, very unusually, um, a, a large gas cloud actually obscures the crest of the anticline. And for some time, it was suspected that the, uh, the shape of the field was like a, a, a volcanic caldera. Uh, essentially with a collapsed crest. Eventually, uh, after a few wells, the crest was drilled and it was established that uh, this was just gas leaking into the overburden, uh, causing a... Uh, obscuring the seismic reflectors. Um, he is seen as the uh, top tor and ekafisk, or base tor and ekafisk. So <clears throat> a map of the field shown on the right here shows that uh, the field is around about three kilometres deep. Uh, it is quite a simple uh, anticline with a north-south, uh, sort of elongated north-south. It consists, the reservoir consists of naturally fractured chalk, um, but I find it kind of hard to imagine that there haven't been induced fractures and we'll see more of some of the operational history of the field as we go forward. A, an oil column of over 300 metres and the two chalk horizons, uh, which are the producing horizons in the field, are the late Cretaceous Tor and the early Paleocene Ekephys formation. Very high porosity, but generally low permeability uh, and lower again in the, in the aquifer. In terms of infrastructure, well, if you can imagine this map with only two fields, Ekafisk and Cod, they were the only two that were within this area at the time of the drilling of the Ekafisk discovery. Now there are lots of fields in and around both the Norwegian continental shelf and also across to the west into the UK and to the south into Denmark. The field uh, is not just Ekafisk, but there are a number of fields that actually contribute um, or have contributed hydrocarbons into uh, the hub at Ekafisk, and some not even shown on this map. The gas is then transported south to, to Germany and the oil goes um, west to the UK at Teesside. In terms of field life, um, it's well documented that there was subsidence um, during the course of the uh, production life of the field, and we'll have a look at that in more detail. In fact, what we can see is that there was subsidence of um, several metres, um, mainly due to the compaction of both, both the ekafisk and the uh, tor chalk. And these two, uh, two horizons uh, actually contributed to some, some uh, additional energy uh, compaction drive, uh, which has aided the recovery of oil from that reservoir. But by 1987, um, it, it had been noticed on studying some photographs that the, one of the platforms in the Ekafis complex uh, was actually... Um, closer to the water or a hatch or a, a window was closer to the water than it had been on some of the original photographs and of course when it was investigated further there was substance. Um, so the platform or the, the platforms had to be jacked up by 
six metres. And in some instances, this had to be a coordinated effort because all of the platforms uh, are connected by pipes and uh, by bridge-linked um, bridge-linked walkways and things, and everything had to go up at the same time, otherwise it would have been prohibitively expensive. So a very successful operation undertaken. Um, some of the uh, interesting things about the investment is looking at this profile, which comes from the, um, the facts um, um, spreadsheet um, on the NPD website, and it shows that there was a maximum spend uh, in sort of 2013 of well over a, a billion dollars. So it's not just the cost of uh, the initial uh, development of the field or the infill drilling, but um, certainly there's been a lot of spend and activity in, in recent years, and we'll see why later. Challenges, well, um, there have been incidents, and back in April 1977, the, uh, the B-14 well blew out. The, the cause was established to be uh, an incorrectly installed um, downhole safety valve. I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> Eight days to uh, regain control of the well, um, and at the time, the uh, and may still be the biggest um, um, leak and, and, and loss of oil to the sea in, in the North Sea to date. Uh, fortunately, no injuries, and, and the platform um, was safe. If we look at the individual profiles, and this is really the, the most interesting fact for me, is by looking at all the contributing fields here, from Ecofisk, Goldfisk, West Ecofisk, to Eda, Cod, Valhal, Tor, Embler, Hod, and Oda, we can see that uh, they surround the Ecofisk field on the map on the left. But they've come on at various stages, with Ecofisk being the first, obviously, uh, and then various tiebacks, some that have since ceased production, but others that um, are still still producing, and in the case of Otto, has just recently come on stream. If we actually uh, use Trove production history, we can look at those collectively. And it really is this slide that I think is the most interesting when we look at the entire history of Ecofisk. Um, Though we have here stacked the oil from all the other fields in the hub, including Elfisk and Valhall, um, we can see that the water, uh, the produced water in the field, suddenly starts in 2000, but only because the information isn't currently made available on the NPD website, so we can't see when the uh, original water breakthrough was for each of these fields. But we can tell quite a lot from just looking at this very unusual profile. Production at Ecofis started with, uh, with four wells produced directly to a tanker, and this is while the development was ongoing and the platforms were being constructed. Once the platforms were in place, the, few, the, the wells were brought on, online, and we can see a period here from around about 1975 through to about 1987, uh, we're getting a fairly um, linear uh, decline and the field at this time is heading for a recovery factor of the order of about 17%. But what's most unusual is from 1987 through to around about 2003, uh, we see not a, a production decline but a production incline. Progressively the offtake rate was increased and production over that period of time produced a huge amount of oil. That's mainly because in 1989, a, a, a very large field-wide water injection campaign was undertaken. And uh, we can see here that the secondary peak in 2003, the field was still producing in, of the order of 300,000 barrels of, of oil per day. Now, the other noticeable feature of, uh, of, of the field is in the period 2013 to the present day where you can see that essentially the decline has, has pretty much been halted. The reason for that is a commitment both in the sort of 2010 period where 
the four VA platform, 10 injectors were drilled. And then in 2013, when the massive spend went on, basically 35 producers and eight water injectors were commenced drilling, which has both increased the output and certainly halted the uh, halted the decline. There are 10 platforms at Ecofisk. Some have uh, come and some have gone, and uh, others have been replaced. But um, generally speaking, this is what the infrastructure looks like. One of these platforms, the, the Z platform, was installed as recently as 2013. So a, a major complex. Here we can have a look at the, uh, the forecast. In the uh, top left, we see both oil and water forecasts. Um, and we have a look at this on a number of different, uh, different views, uh, looking at logarithmic linear scales. And here, looking at a water ratio versus cumulative oil production plot. And we can actually see that this trend uh, that we're predicting here um, it looks in line with recent well performance, but we can also see that it perhaps looks a little bit conservative, that we are really essentially declining from early time, uh, from, from today uh, forward. But this is the basis uh, of, a, of our independent uh, forecasting tool within, uh, within Trove production. And here's the subsequent reserve story, and if we look, we take a water cut limit of 97%. This then drives uh, an estimated cessation production out to 2051. Now, that's really as, as far as we are going to take it at this time. It, it could be that it's parts of the complex uh, may still be economic and still be functioning at or around this date or after. So on uh, our current estimate, based on a uh, January 2020, uh, using this technique, we've estimated the remaining oil reserves of 590 million barrels of oil. These are the present owners of the, the field, and there are a number of references which you may wish to go and have a look at where some of this material comes from. Alternatively, come and send an email to info at firstsong.com and find out about our Trove database products for all the offshore oil fields, discoveries, gas fields, prospects and leads in Northwest Europe and beyond. Please like the video, share it with somebody, send it to somebody who you think would be interested and please subscribe to our channel because we put out videos like this on a regular basis. Stay safe, thank you for watching and look forward to seeing you next time.